So I guess over the last two decades, uh, it's no secret that we've had some significant changes to farming systems, um, especially moving to conservation farming, low, low disturbance, high residue, increased soil moisture, retention of soil organic carbon, uh, changing cropping rotations, um, explosion in canola production, fertiliser input sowing times and increased insecticide use. So I guess the reasons for doing those things are fairly well understood, but the secondary effects on the status of insects aren't so well understood, and I think we're just starting to see the lag, lagged effects of some of those changes on our pest complex, and de including the increased incidence of some pests, the declines in other species. We're seeing new pests which weren't traditionally considered agricultural pests starting to come through, and we're seeing some of our long-standing pests uh, actually undergo some behavioural changes as well. So just to set the scene, I guess earth mites is one example where we've seen increased prevalence of certain species, blue oak mite, clover mite, um, belustium mite, in addition to our old enemy, the red-legged earth mite. We've had some wireworms uh, undergo host range changes, um, particularly with canola coming on the scene, some of these pests have gone onto that crop and it's become a favoured host. Several weevils have emerged as more serious pests and we've seen mandolotus um, come to the fore since the late 90s and I'll talk about that one today. <coughs> Slugs are obviously becoming a bigger and bigger issue and again I'll cover that one. And millipedes and earwigs, until recently we didn't really have any solid evidence that these things were feeding on crops even though people would continually tell us because we've always thought of them as you know organic matter feeders and that sort of thing but it's pretty clear now that they, uh, they are becoming a serious issue in certain soil types and in high stubble, high residue systems. It's fair to say that the mechanisms for, for the changes in the complex aren't very well understood, but I guess the things that you can identify fairly easily are um, the provision of food and shelter at key times, and particularly over summer, where traditionally we have a, a drought uh, which tends to break the life cycle of a number of these resident insects. Now uh, many of them have um, suitable habitat and shelter to breed and survive. With uh, commonly used insecticides, certain pests have uh, differential susceptibility and I guess year after year if, if we're putting out the same things, uh, sooner or later uh, that's going to alter the balance. And with canola, clearly it's a favoured host plant for many of these species I've listed. The tricky bit is how to manage the risk, I guess, when it comes to trying to establish a crop. And for better or worse, our options are fairly limited at this stage. We have essentially either cultural techniques, uh, and many of those would run counter to those changes I mentioned earlier um, in relation to conservation farming. And the other tool is broad spectrum insecticides which, despite us using them fairly regularly, still aren't exactly doing the job to our satisfaction because we're seeing these same pests appear year after year and in some cases increasing. So the point I'm trying to make today, I guess, is that if you break the season into the, uh, the in-season where you've got your crop and the, and the off-season, I think in a lot of cases our pest management is restricted to in-season which is a fairly, I guess, reactive way to, to deal with insects. And at that time of the year, our only options are to use insecticides. So do we need to revisit some of these cultural techniques, you know, on a one-off basis? Can, can we include cultivation, uh, you know, every six or seven years in certain paddocks just to uh, help break the cycle? And uh, we'll run through some pests. Now, what I'm going to present today is in many cases ex existing knowledge and it's not necessarily my recommendations for what you should do this year it's just a here are the tools um, in problem paddocks and it's up, really up to you to weigh this up with your clients as to the, tr the trade-offs that may happen if you for example decide to burn snails is clearly probably the hottest topic going around at the moment um, the reason we've had explosion I guess in numbers in the last two seasons is we've had those wet summers, soil moisture, summer weeds, the traditional summer, summer treatments which rely on certain weather conditions, we haven't had as many opportunities. The main reason last year seems to be that we had a unseasonal summer breeding event which meant we had juvenile snails 
in paddocks by March, which is well before baiting usually starts. And really that left guys on the back foot because once you've got juveniles, you really can't control them in the same winter growing season because they don't, they don't appear to take the baits. So many guys have spent many tens of thousands of dollars on baiting, uh, still without disrupting the breeding cycle. Uh, many crops were, were lost and re-sown, some weren't even harvested um, due to contamination issues and fouling of pastures in, in mixed systems. So where do we go? I guess uh, everyone's aware of the Basham Burdum Batum. It is still a good tool and it's probably the best tool we have for snail management um, but clearly with, with the changing conditions we've had in the last two seasons there does appear to be some room for fine tuning and some additional information. Uh, I guess for this season what we're facing is that all those juveniles from last year couldn't actually be controlled effectively and we may see some of those carry into this season. So. This is one case where you know, some slightly more drastic action may be needed in problem paddocks just to, to reduce the numbers. So summer weed control really is, is critical when it comes to summer, summer treatments. Um, it makes all the rest of those treatments more effective. Um, stubble bashing traditionally on hot days is best to knock snails onto the soil surface. It's best if you get a couple of hot days in a row. But, in the last couple of seasons we haven't had as many hot days as we'd like, so perhaps we, we can't be too choosy with that as well. Burning is a fairly drastic step to take, but it is the most effective pre-sowing management for snails. And when it comes to baiting, the critical issue and the critical timing is to do it before the adults lay eggs. And as you know, they east to bait over summer, normally, when it's dry, and when you have adequate moisture they come down and start feeding and mating. So really, the baiting needs to occur in, in moist conditions before egg laying. Now last year, that may have had to have happened in summer to have prevented them laying. So there's questions around, you know, is that a good idea? Is that something we need to consider in the future? Just a reminder on burning the importance of controlling weeds beforehand. Uh, you get a much more effective kill if you do. Slugs are a problem and tend to be restricted to heavier soil types with a clay, clay component. Again, this pest is moisture driven, so in many ways slugs and snails are an indicator of healthier farming systems, I guess. Uh, we had multiple species involved last year, things that don't, don't do as well in normal dry years. So factors that increase damage, um, heavier soils where there was summer moisture, summer weeds not controlled adequately, any other factors that retarded or staggered crop emergence, really increased damage. There was a, a widespread lack of monitoring which meant that slugs were detected too late and uh, burning occurred not well. Paddocks that were burned with a hot burn appeared to do a little bit better than ones that weren't burned. Again not necessarily recommendations, just an observation. So. If you're really serious about slugs, and it, it may pay to prioritise paddocks, I guess, identify those ones you think you may have a problem in this year, based on, you know, did you have a problem last year? Removing weeds by incorporating stubble to remove all slug refuges, that's, that's important. Cultivation gives you about the same efficacy as a bait treatment. Now, rolling is a good idea too, to restrict slug movement and help establishment. Establishing crop early, has been shown to reduce seedling losses. So look at your higher vigor, higher vigor varieties and, and so forth, and sowing times, and seeding rates. In terms of insecticides, um, the best time to bait is at sowing, not before, it's actually not worth baiting before sowing, um, despite what I've written in that book there. <laughs> been doing some research since then. Uh, one application at sowing as, is as good as applying twice, so there's actually no benefit in putting another application on. And I guess unlike snails, slugs don't have that distinct break in the breeding cycle. So really you need to put the bait out when you need the seedling protection. Earwigs, heavier soils, high stubbles, um, do most of their feeding at night. These are the reports that come in through pest facts since 2006. Uh, as you can see, mostly canola, occasionally in lupins. And uh, again, where you had late sown crops or they were 
delayed or staggered in their emergence, greatly increased the damage. Millipedes are favoured by, again, organic soils, retained stubble. You can start to see some themes emerging here. Again, nocturnal feeders. Um, quite a few crops in the mid-north had to be re-sown last year due to millipedes. Uh, there's only six pest facts reports there, but uh, most of those were probably last year and the year before. Similar controls for both of these species. The best way to um, control them is probably to manage residues over time. Um, other than that, sowing less susceptible crops. Cultivation or burning may work, but we don't have any information on that. Again, rapid establishment is probably one of the keys for this, higher seeding rates, and seed dressings evidently had some benefit for higher, bigger varieties, but if you had a, a slow growing variety, um, it still got hammered. Follow your SPs, it really is a numbers game with these two pests, you don't get great control, it's more about trying to get your crop away. I know a lot of guys this year are just going to go in basically with 900 mils of chlorpyrifos and a, and a fipronil seed dressing, so that's how, uh, how much of an issue it is for, for some guys. Bronze field beetle, we had quite high numbers last year. We had early warning because there was quite high numbers of adults in backyard, you know, backyards and they would have laid eggs. Obviously they were in paddocks as well, they laid eggs and the larvae came through and hammered some canola and lupins. Unlike other wire worms, this one feeds at the soil surface so you can get some control with foliar insecticides. Again, most of our pest, pest facts reports have been in canola and lupins Primarily in June, we had not only the ring barking of seedlings by larvae, but we had some harvest contamination issues in the lower north last year too from the adults. And if you do manage your residues, it probably will eliminate the problem. Now that photo there is from some Western Australian research where they raked and didn't rake some other plots, and you can see the clear differences there. As I mentioned, foliar insecticides can, can help. In terms of reducing harvest contamination, um, minimising the autumn population is one way. Avoid leaving windrows on the ground for too long. If you do have issues, harvesting in the hottest part of the day may help because the, the, the beetles move down from the windrow onto the soil surface. Make sure you get your identification correct. We had some confusion a couple of seasons back where uh, beneficials were actually being misidentified as bronze field beetle. So just keep an eye out there. And the way you can tell a, uh, well, the adults are a bit tricky, but the larvae, if they've got the big forward facing mouth parts and so forth, uh, the chances are it's a predator. Mandolotus is one that's emerged since the late 90s on lighter soil types. Does most damage in canola, but seems to have a wide host range. Up until recently, there was very little known about its biology, but GRDC have uh, funded us funded the Sadi group for two years to try and uh, gain some insight there. And this is the summary of the pest packs reports. You can see canola by far gets the most reports there, mainly in June. Cereals come in a bit later. Lentils again, later again, and some lupin damage there in June as well. So this thing appears to be spreading beyond just the, the Mallee regions. Um, it appears that the most serious damage happens when blokes haven't sown canola before and are surprised when they're losing all of their seedlings. So, not too sure what's going on there. It could be a, a, a link with crop rotations, many pasture, and so forth. So, as I mentioned, we started a, a project last year. We managed to find some paddocks in the Mallee which had weevils, which was a great achievement, I thought, and followed them through the season and have managed to construct an indicative life cycle at this stage. And what we've learned is that it is a resident pest, so it completes its entire life cycle within the paddock. It's not moving in from elsewhere. As you can see, the adults are active from April through to September, but really we don't hear anything in the way of crop damage after, after crops get away. So it was quite surprising to learn the adults were still there. So if you look, at the adults below the soil surface, you can see that they start emerging from underneath the soil around about the end of March. 
Incidentally, they seem to oversummer about 30 centimetres down in the paddocks we've sampled, which is a long way down. So that suggests that things like cultivation aren't really going to help very much. So eggs are laid all through that adult period. We then have larvae feeding on roots in the soil profile and moving deeper and deeper through winter and spring and pupating around <coughs> Christmas time before emerging again as adults where they appear to rest for the late summer period. In autumn we found them sheltering under a wide range of weeds prior to crop emergence. Um, brassica or turnip weeds seem to be a favourite one. We had very great difficulties finding enough to do any work with. They're very hard to spot in the field. As you can see, this is where you often find them. In paddocks, you have to have pretty uh, sharp eyes. This was one in Malala last year on heavier soil, which was an interesting one, because as I said, most of them find on lighter soils. We're not really at the stage of being able to provide definitive controls for it, but I guess checking under weeds in autumn is the best way to monitor at this stage. If you're finding numbers, think about not putting in canola. Perhaps getting the crop away early before peak adult activity may work, because once the crops get to about four leaf, they don't appear to be susceptible anymore. In terms of chemical control, really there's no substitute for regularly checking your crops through that emergence period, particularly if you've got canola. I mean, Obviously it's not practical in every paddock, but if you've got a, a canola paddock in a mandolotus area, Murray Lands, um, York Peninsula and so forth, it might be worth your time. Foliar insecticides, uh, chlorpyrifos appears to be uh, more effective than uh, alpha cyphermethrin. that seems to not kill them, makes them sick, but anyway. And guys that use a bare air spray of bifenthrin appear to have less problems. But if I knew I had mandolotus problems, I'd probably be sticking fipronil on the seed as well. So, to summarise what I've presented, you can see some common themes for all of these pests. And uh, maybe it is worth thinking about including some of these more drastic cultural techniques, you know, once every X number of years to, uh, to just break that, uh, that insect life cycle. Because these, these insects I've talked about all do complete their life cycle within the paddock environment. So if we can make it hostile for them for a, a period of time, three weeks, a month, maybe we won't have so many problems the following year. But clearly there are um, opportunities for, uh, for some more targeted trial work around these sorts of things as well. Uh, look, early crop establishment with a seed dressing is probably going to go a long way as well. The main message is to plan ahead. Um, don't just leave pest management till the, once the crops come up, by that time you're pretty much hamstrung. Um, make use of that other six months that you've got to think about uh, what, what can be done to make it a hostile environment for pests. So I guess just to uh, highlight some of those research issues, we probably do need to understand the links a bit better between insects and the cropping environment so we can optimise the trade-offs and understand you know, how often can we cultivate without compromising our, uh, our best management practice. And there's plenty more we, uh, we need to do on individual species as well. And just to let you know, we're still on the end of the phone. If you need to uh, contact us, um, if you'd like to subscribe to the newsletter, you can do it at the trade table. We run a diagnostic service as well to help you with your IDs. Uh, during February, we did have a population of hoppers in the mid-north region, approximately from the Kalunga area up to about Georgetown. It's a sort of 30k by 30k hotspot of hoppers. They've now fledged into adults and um, are drifting around up in the mid-north. We don't expect those adults to last until seeding time, but the question is whether they'll lay eggs. And if they do, some of them might hatch out straight away and be a bit of a nuisance at seeding, and some of them may hatch out in spring. So keep your eyes out for egg laying and, and give me a ring if you, if you see it. But at this stage, locusts are a, you know, a minimal risk, I guess, this year. Sorry? Do you expect a problem later on? No, not really. We're not expecting any mass migrations from interstate. Um, these guys are pretty much the leftovers from 2010. And, and the only reason they've been able to tick on this long is those wet summers. Yeah. Well, I wonder with five questions, aren't you?
style is pretty stuff there. Uh, they gave people hell uh, this season in many areas. And late in the season, it seemed that there were lots, lots of little small ones. Is that because that there are two cycles in the one season? Or where do those late, the small ones late in the season come from? It's, it's actually quite hard to tell how, how old a snail is from its size. Uh, you actually can't do it. It depends on what the conditions were like. They may have been laid two weeks prior and developed through to that size, or they may have been laid back, or the, well, they may have hatched out, I should say, back in March. And then conditions weren't favourable, so they just went into a resting type state. So, don't know where they came from. Um, they may have been ones that, that did hatch out um, in that summer period that couldn't be controlled by baiting during the season. So you're saying bait, when the eggs are being laid early in the season, yeah. uh, if you're not too sure whether they're laying eggs late in the season, is there a defence for farmers late in the season? Not really. Apart from, as I said, once the crop's in the ground, baiting's the only option. And by the time you get to winter, um, the efficacy of the baits is likely to be a lot less because there's so much other food around. So really the key is to get in early, before egg laying, to try and uh, prevent that next generation coming through. It's not a perfect control, but that's, uh, the timing of that is very important. Okay. And any experience in spraying them with coffee? Not personally. We know caffeine does kill and repel snails. The, um, the, no the South Australian No-Till Farmers Association has been doing some work on caffeine. And they've had some reasonable success with field trials. Uh, there are issues with formulating a product and getting a registration, and, and I guess they're looking to see whether there's, you know, going to be any wider industry support to. Um, what kind of rate would you recommend? What would I recommend? <laughs> two percent works if you can get it onto the. Uh, two percent. How's that? Are um, more agronomists reporting uh, the predators? How are they going in terms of their identification? Well, it's definitely improved in the last three or four years. Uh, I mean, there's still a bit of confusion between some pests and beneficials, but you know, through these insect identification workshops we've run, I think you know quite a lot of agronomists have attended those now, and uh, most of them are just ringing up to confirm their own identifications. So, I mean, that's great. I think it's definitely improving.